Possession crucial from this. How much longer will the referee allow? Dublin lead by a point. Oh, and there's the whistle. It's over. It's over. We earned it by winning the last two matches on the road, and that's not going to be taken away from us. But what I love in Hurland, I love players that will never give in. He hits it. He hits it. Wow. It's over the bar. Everybody and welcome along to the latest RTGAA podcast. Peter Canavan's going to be along a little bit later on with myself and Rory to chat football, but we're going to start with hurling first. And Shane McGrath, the Munster Hurling Championship to me is still, like Jackie Tyrrell described it as the jewel in the crown. I think Cork and Tip proved this to us on Saturday night, that that is exactly what this championship is. Yeah, hard to disagree, Jackie, I suppose. It's the gift that keeps on giving at the moment. And um, obviously down in Munster, we, we obviously love it, like, and we love our Munster final. I think it's, it's probably second to the All-Ireland final. And I, I think that's a fair enough comment to say. Like, um, like I mean, people come down from, from Derry and from Donegal everywhere, you know, to see Munster Hurling finals. And I think, you know, you can understand why. Um, I remember a funny story quickly. I remember we played a Munster final in 2009. And on the Tuesday, uh, we, were, we went out on the Monday as well. As doesn't seem to be allowed anymore, but we were, we were up for the crack anyway. And uh, on the Tuesday, we were, we were going training and, we, we, we were driving down anyway and there was three or four guys in uh, Derry t-shirts they were still around after the Munster final so uh, that's the kind of I think that's the kind of uh, the draw it has to people but look it's the gift that keeps giving Jackie had everything there um, huge cock support and um, if, 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 if there's one drawback for tip at the moment it's probably the supporters um, I don't know what it is Jackie and Liam Cal touching after the game and, and my own brother was down at it and he just said it was eight nine to one maybe four terraces packed the car so hopefully the tip crowd now will get out in a couple of weeks time for when Limerick comes to town in Torres but unbelievable stuff atmosphere as Jackie said the jewel in the, the jewel in the crown at the moment but <clears throat> I just think in the long term Jackie um, the games are unbelievable but I mean is it going to take its toll on the teams that eventually mm. come through with what's happening on the other side, yeah. um, with all due respect, the, the two top teams, Galway and Kenny, they just kind of went at it because for about maybe 50 minutes and that was it. Whereas if you stop after 50 minutes in the Munster Championship, you're losing the game and that's the way it is. So phenomenal stuff. Um, scores, goals. We've leaked seven goals and we're still in the Championship. So that's probably that's probably a pro and a con in itself. So look, yeah, unbelievable stuff. Um it really had everything like, you know, I mean, the, I, I mean, some of the, some of the pictures afterwards from um, one of the terraces, just looking down on it, it, it'd be something similar you'd see maybe after like a Champions League final, that kind of dusk thing, packed, the red, the blue and gold, it's just one of those magic, it'll definitely be down as one of the photos of the year. So yeah, look, had it all Jackie and, you know, hopefully more or less, we're, we're, we're getting greedy now, aren't we? Like what I think we're, we're hoping for more or less the same now. Um, next weekend, again, with Aaron Watford. Like, yeah, I think Rory, though, Shane's point is exactly right. It's actually what the toll of it is, because even just to get out of Monster, of Monster now is such a dogfight when you look at those kind of matches. Massive toll. And the only thing, I suppose, Jackie, is they're spread out a little bit more in this current campaign. I think something that maybe got lost so in so, somewhat in the narrative around uh, Saturday's game it was Cork's second game within six days and I definitely did think they tired towards the back end and that's only natural I mean that's not a criticism of them in any way and um, they have two weeks off now and I think that's an ideal amount of time to recharge and reset because they're going to have it all to do I mean their two their two remaining games is a way to Clare and a way to Limerick uh, you, they're going to need at least a point from one of those games and Right now, you wouldn't say that's a gimme. I mean, Corker's sitting top of the table at the minute, but there's every chance they might still be eliminated. And that's just the beauty of this Munster Hurling Championship. Jackie mentioned it's the jewel in the hurling crown. It's the jewel in the GA's crown. Attendances, you know, drama, storylines, scripts. It's just an amazing championship, an absolutely amazing championship. The only negative is, to go back to your original point, is there lettering seven types of lard out of each other and by the time they get out when you look at what's going on in Leinster it is a bit of an advantage and that might come back to bite some of the Munster teams at the back end like one of the things that I thought was very noticeable was from a management perspective you've got to be very judicious about your use of substitutions now because lads are dropping like flies particularly in the way the games are all jammed up against each other 
So you need to nearly keep one card in your pocket for the last 10 minutes, because if you use all fives, five subs, and somebody goes down with a hamstring, you could find yourself down to 14, which Tipperary probably should have found themselves down to on Saturday night, Shane. But at the same time, um, you know, like it's just a frenetic championship that delivered again on um, on Saturday night. And, you know, like it, it, the great thing is we're only halfway there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the great thing. Well, come here, let's touch on that point then that Rory's talking about, about Tip maybe being down to 14 men. A lot of talk about this Ronan Marr incident. A lot of talk about the head high tackles generally, Shane. Yeah. What, like, what's your sense of where this thing is going? Because there's no doubt about it. It is, there is, it is more prevalent in the game now than ever before. Yeah, and I suppose, <clears throat> reading up on it and listening to yourselves last night, Jackie, and um, I think it was Barry Kelly uh, did a piece as well on it, and, and even Brian Gavin as well. And I suppose... For me, like what it is, is right. We talk, we, we even spoke about before on this, like about the helmets. Are the helmets a kind of a asher? You could go at this and he has the protection, he'll be fine or she'll be fine. For me, what a big part of it is, too. And I thought it was very interesting. A couple of people brought it up. Suppose we're playing a game now, inter county wise, anyway, that we want to run the ball more than we've ever done in, before in the history of Hurland, right? So if you take it before, Jackie, it, there was rarely a kind of a, a taken on your man all the time thing unless it was inside the 21 1v1 um, cornerback versus full forward coming at pace but it's still 1v1 where I think the more and more the hits are coming in is we're running balls through the line and it's crazy town around the middle so instead of that 1v1 it's now 5v4 or 6v5 yeah. in this kind of 20v20 block and I think that's where the hits have gone up because it's there's more there's more of an opportunity for hits to go in secondly the condition guys are in, they, they have spent months and months and months priming themselves physically. And obviously, if they feel they have it in them and they can use it as an advantage and try and hit a guy fairly, they're going to try and do it. Like. So I think there are two of the big points that we're running the ball more and more. And, and because of that, we're running into traffic and this opportunity for the hits is coming in. Even if you look at Rona Mahers the other night, and do I feel it was a red card? Look, there's no point me sitting here and I'm, I'm talking about Jamie Flanagan's one or I'm even talking about maybe Jack Grealish is one. I mentioned it. As a Tipperary person, you have to say that Rona Matters one was a red card. And I feel as if you look at Rona Matters body language, I know Rona, we know Rona very well, hurled with him, you know, been watching him. I think he's top class. If the hands go over the head mm. and I think he feels I'm gone. I'm, I'm, I might be gone here. And I'd say the relief in him when he got the yellow card was unreal. But even look, even look back at it, lads, and I watched the clip over and over again. Mikey Breen is in front of him. He's kind of, you know, Dara Fitz is there. There's another car player there. And, and Ronan and Dara Fitz just, just come in. And Ronan comes in and Dara dips his head and he right to do it. You know, I think Ronan is going in to hit him fairly, but unfortunately he doesn't. And that's where the, the crux of it is. But what's the answer, lads? There has to be red cards. And I think that has to be, it'll, it'll have to happen soon. I believe the referees are meeting this week for, they, they have their, their, fitness, um, their fitness testing. And I'm sure no more so than the hand passes are, we might as well just call them the throws from now on are brought up before it's definitely going to be brought up about this Ronan's at the weekend Jamie Flanagan's one uh, even Dara Gray's one there on uh, Connor David I think for Wexford at the weekend as well and we say Jack Grealish last week the, mm. one, the, the, comment, the one in the carry the one in the carry off the, the one in the carry off league game was frightening yeah that, it was like and I suppose with the, as you said Rory like the common thing there is nobody got sent off yeah and I think I think someone someone is going to suffer because of this. And how do I mean by that? I think I mean, the referees need more support as well, though, Shane, right? Because one thing that I think is you, you can have all the trial by media in the world and sometimes yeah. you blow something up in slow motion afterwards. And look, we're all guilty of it because that's part of the game. You analyze it, you have to look at it. But I think if a referee is being asked now to watch a ball that's moving at 100 miles an hour with 30 players on the pitch and crowds around, as you say, of four and five people everywhere, I think it could be a referee, lads. Oh, uh, yeah. 100%, Jackie. Yeah, I suppose we have the advantages of the playbacks. We, we watch them from angles, different angles. We... We get everybody's opinion. They have to make a split-second decision. But I suppose the thing with the referees is that if they feel at the time and they're talking to each other and they feel, look, I didn't see it, that's fine. But that's where the sighting can come in. Where, where the issue is, is if the referee feels, look, I did see it, I don't feel it was intentional, that's it then. I don't think, I, might, I could be wrong on that now, Rory. Jackie, mm. you might know better than that. But I don't feel 
any. But he gave really Ronan going. Maher. He gave Ronan Maher a yellow card. So if he gave him a yellow card, the question I would ask Paul O'Dwyer is, what did what you did book him? See? What did you what book did him see? for? And it was it on the word of the linesman. But look, I think the, the big thing for this and for me is I would imagine there's a certain Kilkenny man in Danesford with the name Richie Hogan looking at this going, well, holy moly. That's what I yeah. was thinking. I, I got sent off for probably something a lot in an All-Ireland final, in the first half of an All-Ireland final, for something that was probably, okay, it was an elbow to the head, and the, but it mightn't have been anywhere near, as near as severe as some of the ones we've seen in recent weeks. And that was four years ago, bro. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what's happened in the interim that we now say, okay, shots to the head are cool, lads. We'll just bang you with a yellow because I don't want to wreck the game here. And that's another key point. And this is in Cork Winged because, look, I think there were stuff on both sides. For instance, Robbie O'Flynn's goal should have been disallowed, by the way. He took about 12 steps. But the thing is, T- Tipperary are down to 14. Now, they've proven it in the past. They were down to 14 against Wexford, and they were heroic in, term- in terms of turning that game, that all Ireland semi-final around in 2019. But if you go down a player against Cork, they will destroy you. Because if they have a loose player, just the way they can play hurling, that Sabutio-like hurling that Cork can play, and that's a very, it has a very, very different complexion on a game where one team might have been flagging in terms of um, fatigue and because of the fact that this game was a second game within six days. So it was a very significant decision as as well from a competitive point of view and in terms of how this whole championship might fare out. Mm. Yeah. And that, listen, I think that's a fair point. I just, on the wider issue, like I'm with you, Shane, I just think it's, it's what's it going to take for a cultural behavior to change. Because the hand passing thing is one thing you're trying to speed up the game. Yeah. This is actually player welfare, which if really, if we all want to support the game at every level, like you guys have kids, I have kids, hurling people want their children to be able to play this game as well. And I think yeah. that that's mm. the difficulty, you know. That's it. And you said, nutshell, Jackie, nobody gets concussed from a bad hand pass. Yeah. <laughs> or, a, or a throw ball. <laughs> like, you yeah, know, I suppose. Exactly. That's, Let them throw it. Let them throw it. That's what it is. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the, the other, we're, we're going down yeah. a different road now. <laughs> yeah. The other big talking point over the weekend, and look, in fairness, it's fair to say Don Logue went on the mother of all rants on the Sunday game about this. Uh, in fairness to him, he was incredibly impassioned about the Tipperary court game being on GAA Go rather than on live television. And Rory, I suppose maybe you're probably as well placed as anybody to give us a sense of just how difficult it is, even in the modern era of just trying to get all these games on television and the difficulties that go with it. It's not a simple puzzle, like, but Don Logue's point is well made that perhaps hurling needs a little bit more backing because there's no doubt about it. We are missing out on massive crowds being able to see games like this. It is like... It is a very small window, Jackie. Um, I think what Don Logue said last night, I think to me, it was a triumph of public service broadcasting and it was a triumph of the freedoms with which we all enjoy in this country. And I think the producer of the programme, I think yourself and I think RT Sport deserve credit to have the bravery and the courage to actually address this and bring it up as a subject matter because it is what people are talking about. I think from the G, we live in a world of subscription TV. We all have our Netflix and our Amazon Primes and our Disney Pluses and all of that, right? I think people will eventually get used to this notion. It's probably in its infancy in terms of a cultural mindset. The biggest problem, though, with GA Go for me is accessibility. The broadband infrastructure in this country is not of a very good standard. I have people constantly texting me from very, and you don't even have to be that remote to have struggles with broadband connections. So it, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if this was a venture that's maybe a year or two ahead of where the broadband infrastructure can deliver the kind of product that people can get access to this in a more in an, in, a, in an easier fashion and i think that is where it comes back to people of certain generations whether they're old or young not being given the opportunity to watch the games and there has been a lot of monster hurling matches there's another one next saturday night waterford against clare and that'll be a big game who knows waterford could turn clare over there another big story in the monster hurling championship where waterford resurrect their season again you know out of mind's eye and i think from don log's point of view i think it was brave i think from your point of view i think it was brave 
And I think it was commendable. And these are the kinds of discussions that the Sunday game is built for. And I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, and listen, Shane, I think it's actually just reflective of what's going on. Like, I mean, listen, the three of us are all involved in clubs as well. And, you know, like, it's what we're hearing on the ground from people being able to say, look, I just love to hear more. And I like, I think on the on Dunlop's wider point of the visibility of hurling, I think it's an interesting debate that needs serious looking at because when he lays it out you're looking at the window of championship and hurling will be over very quickly there's a lot yep. of football in there you know yeah it will you know and like I I, I said it as well like I'm I, I'm involved in the club and I love I love the club love playing the championship and I think we are trying to squash all this in particularly the hurling I mean even Sean even what Sean Kevin has said like he feels there's too many football matches on now and he is you know he's he's a guy who's first love and all and 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 his main love and passion is Gaelic football. And for him to say, we actually have too many matches now. And we're at the other side of the, on the hurling fence going, we've actually, we're actually not getting enough matches maybe, like, you know, kind of thing. Or if we are, we're trying to get everything bet into here, into, into the space of, to use Don Logue's thing, the microwave championship, you know? Like, I mean, I, 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 for me, Jackie, right? Like the end of April, right? Say last week, the end of April, what for the two games played and potentially, they're, potentially, their championship, they could be looking at their championship season being over, like, you know. But Baron, massive performances now next Saturday night and against Tipperary. And we're just trying to condense it all, we're trying to push it all in. I think push it out a little bit further. Like, it, not, we're not even asking for the All Ireland League going back to September, but two, three weeks, like, started in May. And I think, and someone I had an argument in on Twitter, the, 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 the best place in the world, if, if, if you're up for a row and it's whatever time of night or day it is, just go on Twitter, just type something and someone will come back and disagree with you. Even, you know, the sky is blue. Someone will disagree with you. But it's just like they said, oh, but you're pushing it back and it's going back too far and everything won't get played. The two teams in the Ireland Hurling Final last year, Kilkenny and Limerick, both their county finals were played in October. Yeah. Like both of them. Like, it, it wasn't a fact that, you know, one of them had to put it off to November or anything like that. Most other... Hurling Championships county finals are October, regardless of anything. So I think those those county championships can get run off. They're 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 well structured now. County championships are well structured. Most of them, it's in Tipperary, for example, it's sixteen teams. It's four groups of four. You have three games. Like if you lose your first game, you're in trouble. So I think the hurling championship. I I love the split season. I really really do. But I just think we're we're trying to push this all in and get it all done really really quickly and out of the way. And, and people might say here, Jackie, listen to us now, or whatever might say, yeah, but the club is 99 or 98% in exactly. It is, exactly. But like, let's be honest, let's. 30,000 people going to a club match, never going to happen. Never going to happen. So like, if we're on about really promoting this in, in the counties where Hurling isn't as strong, yeah, they play Hurling everywhere, but it's, it, it wouldn't be as strong. And as I said, if I'm from a county, maybe like Leitrim or something, and I'm getting into Hurling or, or you know, I, I, I want to get into Hurling, there's no way, Jackie, I'm going to keep refreshing and keep refreshing to try and watch a hurling match. I'm just going to, I'm just going to flick on something else. So, I think that's that's my opinion on it. I I feel the structure is good, but maybe just just push it back a bit, just just spread it out a little bit more for people. You will get your club championships played 100. percent It was uh, Jackie. I, I'd say it was it was quite the interesting editorial discussion in advance. I'd say going into oh, last night. Well. If you had if you had a camera <laughs> yeah, yeah, on us, uh, pre and post, there would have been yeah. a fly on the oh. wall top to be made there. That good, is good crack, good crack. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, good chats and good debates, um, which mm. I'm sure we'll come back to. Come here before we finish off. Then let's look at the Leinster Championship because. I, I do think, Rory, to your point, you know, when you look at what's going on in Munster, you are kind of looking at Leinster then and going, meh, you know, yeah. like great story for Dublin at the weekend, which they definitely deserve credit. But it was always going to be probably between Dublin and Wexford, like with all due respect to Antrim and Westmeath. I think after Antrim didn't get something out of those two early games, it felt like it was going to come down to this game. So big result for Dublin, but... It, it probably hasn't surprised anybody in the way that the Munster Championship has. No, very predictable. And the worry, I suppose, from a hurling perspective is the, the fall off a cliff nature in form for Wexford. Um, we need Wexford need to really mind their house. I'd be very nervous about Wexford in terms of the spirit seems to be gone out of them. I mean, you're talking about a county that was in an All-Ireland semi-final, ran tip to a point, 
in a game that they should have won maybe uh, only four years ago were Leinster champions. Um, they just look like they're all over the shop. And we saw what happened with Offaly in the past. They went all the way down to Christy Ring. Now, they look, it does look like there's something stirring in Offaly again and they're hopefully on the way back and that, that should be welcomed. But Wexford, I, I mean, what was it, 50 shots? Uh, how many wides did they have? I mean, they're, they're you know... The, uh, the generation of the Conor McDonald's and Lee Chins still carrying the can. Have they got any Carl Dunbar? Maybe a couple of players coming through that you wouldn't necessarily say are they going to sustain their challenge for the next few years. That's the big worry. And um, I think, look, credit, absolutely huge credit needs to go to Dublin. It was a game that they could have very easily lost. It was a draw in the, 70, the 71st minute, I think. And they managed to pull it out. In Donald Burke, they have one of the best forwards in the country who scored an outrageous point. I was like, there's no way he's taking this on. No way he's taking Yeah, greedy. And then, oh, what a point. You know, it was a classic. Like, But uh, they have... They, so I think, look, they should be okay for the third spot now. It's not absolutely a gimme, obviously, if Wexford managed to turn Kilkenny over, but you certainly can't see that now. And the predictability of Galway Kilkenny being in a Leinster final is something that we probably saw from the get-go. And that looks like how things are going to transpire at this stage. Mm. And it just looks, Shane, like they're not going to be tested until they get to that All-Ireland series, no. which I guess for, for them, there's nothing that they can do about it. But it, it it does sort of show you the haves and the haves nots. Yeah, it does. And I suppose even from a Wexford point of view, like say, they, they would take great solace from the fact that what they did in Nolan Park last year against Kilkenny, but they were in a much better place, Jackie, as regards. They had everyone and they had everyone ticking. And, you know, it was Dara's first year down there as well. And, and like I, I, obviously Dara's a good friend of mine. A lot of people might, might or might not know that, but... I, I do feel for him um, on a personal level because Wexford is a team, you know, more so the, the analogy of, of, of a club team where you know you have who you have and, and, and if, two, if one or two or three of those guys go down, it's, you just you, you mightn't have the strength and depth to replace them. And that's what Wexford are like. They, they are a fabulous Hurland County with great tradition, but at the moment, underage as well, they, they just it just doesn't seem to be happening down there in hurling terms, Jackie. Um, you could see there last few years in the minor results, you know, I mean, uh, uh, what what they're, they're, they're not featuring really in, in an underage hurling and minor under 20. There's, you know, teams are teams are really putting up big, big scores against them. And uh, that's a worry for them what's coming through. But, you know, I suppose there's Dublin then as well, taking it out of Parnell, taking it to Crow Park. And Rory, mm-hmm. as you said, 71 minutes gone. I'm sure some Dublin people are going, Jesus Christ, why did we play this in mm-hmm. Parnell Park? You know, but look, they pulled it out of fire. And again, lads, it's Donald Burke. I just think he's unbelievable. I wish, to, I, I, because of who he's playing with, and maybe they might they might not get to a last four. Um, and like, let's be honest, that's where, that's where kind of a lot of points go towards a lot of these individual awards at the end of the year. And I just think if there was some kind of a point system in play that the Donald Burks of this world, I think he deserves an all-star. Um, you know, if Dublin get on a run, he he will be the main man because of this. But uh, I thought he was phenomenal again, Rory. I agree totally with you. Taking on that shot as, as someone who's involved in coaching, it's a no-no. Two no guys way. closing around out by the sideline in Crow Park. And then you just watch it sail over, over your shoulder. Over your shoulder. I think, it's, you know, the, be- the best thing Donald Burke could do is... You know, can we get him a job in Cork, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Is he a guard by any chance? Could yeah. he transfer that? Uh, yeah, that's great. New that's motorway. Brilliant. Do you know what the only shame was, Shane? And I like I know that moving to Croke Park is a big thing for the Dublin hurlers and all that, but 9,000 people, like you're watching it and you're kind of thinking, Jesus, it was like... To, to see for them to grow the game on the whole point of visibility and all that, you'd like to see them get more than 9,000 people in to watch them. Yeah, brutal, Jackie. Sure, like no atmosphere at all, you know. And like, you know, in fairness to the crowd that were there when it got close, they got behind the teams as much as they could. But it's just, it's lost, like it's lost in the forest of of the vastness of Pro Park crowd like that. But come here, listen, Nolan Park the week before, two the yeah. two best teams in Leinster. There's only eleven or twelve thousand people at it. True. I mean, True. There, I mean, there'd be more people at there could be more people at a Walsh Cup game, maybe if, if it was it was going to be entertaining, like you know, that kind of thing. So look, that's definitely something that needs to be looked at. I suppose it's very hard to compare to the Munster Championship because you've just you you have you know, you've just top class games every week. People want to go and see it. Whereas in Leinster, like unless you get unless the Leinster final even there might only be what let's like, twenty five thousand people at a Leinster final even. So I think, you know, it's I, I don't know how you correct that. I don't know how you make people go to matches, like, you know, but um, I suppose it does add to the atmosphere of it of it all as well, having you know 
like you know we've all been in Crow Park lads we've been in the, there with days where there's 83,000 people and we've been in there with days where there's as you said Jackie seven or eight thousand people playing league match and stuff and it's you know it, it, it does it does affect you know the whole atmosphere the whole mood of the game when there is that such a small number at the game yeah so more monster. I think that's what we're all trying to say. Yeah. Uh, look, lads, we'll leave it there. It's been a, a great weekend to catch up on. Shane, uh, we'll talk to you very soon. Thanks a million for being with us. Cheers, guys. Thanks a million. Talk soon. He hits it. He hits it. It's over the bar. Oh, holy Moses. All right, let's chat football then. Peter Canavan <laughs> has joined us and two provincial finals to look over, Peter. And... I suppose the difficulty of both of them is that we probably knew what was going to happen. We knew that it was going to be a a big win either way. I heard Porrick Joyce on the radio yesterday afterwards uh, saying, you know, they were on a hide into nothing. If they win by more, nobody gives them credit. If they win by less, it's, you know, whatever. I guess that's the difficulty of a 14-point win. What did Galway get out of it? Good question. Um, Have they got anything out of it? I'm I'm not too sure. Look, it's, it's a competitive game. Um, in theory, it's it's a competitive game anyway. They they've won a a kind of title, and they're a side that's slowly but surely evolving. Uh, that they've gone from strength to strength. Did we see anything about yesterday's performance that we didn't already know? Probably not, because um, from a defensive point of view, I would say, I think maybe they only conceded three goals throughout the national league. They they have a physical presence and a uh, there's a there's a hard edge to this Galway team that's probably something that you wouldn't have said in you know this past nine or ten years about about this Galway say. So when Parry came in, everybody felt we're going to see much more free flowing football and, and all the rest. But they they're a very hard team to to break down. Moving forward, we always said they had the potential. They always had stylish footballers and and they always wanted to play the Galway way. But now they are becoming more clinical up front. Yes, you can argue, well, it was a you know division four side that they were playing against and they were always going to win. But what was it, 20, you know, 22, uh, 27 shots, 22 scores. Um, the manner in which they can go for goals and, and be clinical. You know, you have Damien Comer playing full forward. The occasions that he went out of the full forward position, Matty Tierney, another six foot, what, three, four player, goes into the edge of square and they know when to kick the ball in. So they're playing a really a really smart game at the minute. I think Ian Burke has, has helped that dimension of gelling that forward line together. The one criticism, I suppose, that, that has been levelled at them is can they all click on the one day? We, we've witnessed Comer and Walsh at various stages last year putting in brilliant individual performances, but we're waiting on the day that these two men hit it off and, and really gel. So did we see that yesterday? Probably not. So, you know, Padraig will, will, Joyce will still say, well, we can improve and there's areas that we will. But they're a team that's, that's motoring really well. I like the way they're going about their business. Tactically, very astute. Uh, they know what they're about. And the team that beats Galway later on down the line will, will have to earn it. Yeah, I agree. And I think that point is very well made there, Rory, that Peter says about getting them all to click on the same day. So Porrick Joyce wasn't afraid to whip Shane Walsh off yesterday. I know people were saying he had a bug and all that during the week, but still ruthless management. So how does he get them all to click? Because there's no doubt if they do, they have the potential to win in All-Ireland. Big time. They, I mean, they're, they're as impressive a team as is out there. They have, they're very big. They're a very big side, right down the middle, particularly. John Maher has been an incredible addition into the midfield. We've seen um, Killian McDade come back into the side like, like he was never away. The form of Comer, I think, you know, th- the threat that he poses on the inside line and then can drift out. The form of Matthew Tierney, arguably footballer of the air territory as things stand, certainly up there anyway. Maybe himself and Connor Turbot would be maybe ones and twos at the minute. That's how good, like, I mean, I think I'll wear the complete package. I think the big problem for them really yesterday, and I know, look, it was mentioned about Shane Walsh and his, and he might have been ill during the week, but I mean, I don't know. He didn't necessarily have his best game against Ross Common either. So I don't know, is it just a lack of form? I certainly can't be confident because he is a confident player. <clears throat> I think maybe an elongated club season, which went on for maybe longer than it should have, and given the drama that followed it, 
um, where P Peter correctly predicted that there would never be a replay. In fairness to you, Peter, you were spot on. And um, I, yeah, you, that's the only mage. I mean, he's, a, he's such a stylish footballer. Uh, and Galway are so workmanlike. Sometimes I wonder, does he fit into the way they play? Is he the type of player that you can carry when he's having an off day on the basis that you're going to get that sort of moment of genius? And then also maybe, is he the kind of player that gets turned on by the big day Croke Park? We saw his display last year in the All-Ireland Final and what he could do when he's on it. But... That would be the only, I suppose, blot in the copybook and everything is rosy for Galway. The only thing is they are going into a reasonably sticky group and they've got Peters, uh, Tyrone coming up next, I think, in that uh, round robin. So that's a good fixture for them to look forward to as well. And it'll be a fantastic test for both teams. Yeah, funny, actually, I was having this chat with uh, Sean Kavanagh yesterday when we were watching the match, Peter. I was saying, do you know, for Galway, if they'd have lost, they would have been in a better group for the All-Ireland Series. Mm -hmm. But... You, you don't want to advocate losing a provincial final because clearly going back to back for the first time in a long time meant a lot to them. But geez, they're in a tricky old group now. You know, I know three will still get out, but it, it's definitely a harder route. But isn't that what you want to, to learn about yourself? True. Competitive games, knowing that there's not that do or day aspect to it. And absolutely down in Salt Hill, you know, both teams will, will be going hell for leather. They'll be trying to win it. But um, back to a point that and what's going to be fascinating about this throne and, and Galway game is the kickouts because down in Tum, Galway went to town for a spell on thrones kickouts, dominated um, thrones kickouts. And you look at the stats from yesterday and Sligo lost 10 of their kickouts. And not only are they losing them, but as soon as Galway uh, win their opposition's kickouts, they're pouncing, they're going for the jugular right away. So that's going to be a real fascinating aspect of the of the Throne Galway game, but uh, you're quite right. They'll have uh, either Armagh or Derry to contend with as well, which uh, which will be fun, uh, and then they'll have Westmead in that group as well. So you'd expect that they'll still they'll definitely come out, but uh, I think at the start of the year, if you give them that option, they'd be happy to win a Connacht title and and be in a tough group. Yeah, they looked like they were uh, enjoying it anyway yesterday as well. Uh, I suppose for Sligo then, Peter, you look at the success of the year to win in Croke Park, to get a Division 4 title, you know, to get promoted, the goodness of getting to a provincial final. You do wonder how much of the gloss is taken off it now, albeit like under 20 success and lots of really good stuff being done at underage level. It's still difficult for, for Tony McEntee to be able to walk away and feel like yesterday was a good day for them. They didn't disgrace themselves, Jackie. They, you know, they, there was glimpses where they performed very well. You know, first 10 or 15 minutes, they, you know, they were well up for it and, and playing. But you just can't make the mistakes, some of the mistakes that, that they made again, a, a quality say, Damien Comer's interception for Matty Tierney's second goal. That that was a goal that, that Slego gave them um, by very poor ball handling. So, yes, you know, some parts, but I think it was Colin Collins made the point before the the Munster final as well, that maybe in uh, a previous era, it was a do-or-day game, uh, that, something that they had to win and prepared to die on their sword. You didn't feel that yesterday with, with Clare. You know, he had said that there's bigger games coming up. Um, and you could say the same for Sligo, although I thought they, they had a real go at it yesterday, but they were just beaten by, by a much better team. There's a feel-good factor in, in Sligo there at the minute. There was a good buzz at, at the game yesterday in, in Castle Bar. They're on their 20s. Uh, fabulous. Their first ever all Ireland final. So a lot of things are going well. And, and I think Sligo will definitely regroup. Why, why wouldn't they? And Tony set them the objective of, of winning at least one game. And, you know, that's... Um, whether they do that or not remains to be seen. But... Um, that's what he set themselves and, and the three big games coming up now. Mm. Kildare, Kildare and Markovic Park will be a game you'd imagine, Jackie, that they will target. And <clears throat> in that round, Robin, your home games will be crucial. So I suppose there will be a sense that that's a game that they could potentially get something out of. I don't know whether Peter would agree. Uh, absolutely, Rory. Um, it depends what Kildare turns up. 
that's the thing. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. Yeah. You you know that what Slego are going to bring. I think they'll have great support for that game and Mark. It's it's a tight. You know, there's tight confines there. Background, yeah. There, it, that'll be a good atmosphere, and you're you're quite right. That's well within their remit to to pull off, a, and it will be a shot. But um, as I said, it will more more will depend on on Kildare that day than Slego. I feel. Yeah. Look, I think. That's the uh, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? Just knowing that maybe one game could get you out of there as well. What about the other twenties, Rory? Generally, like this year and the, the crack that it has given us in terms of football, because there's no doubt the provincial t- championship so far has been poor. The under twenty championship has been phenomenal. When you look at stories like Sligo, like Kildare, and those counties in particular, what they've given us. Thank God for the under twenty championship so far. What a brilliant final as well, Sligo versus Kildare, and it's, and Kildare back again. I think. There are good things happening from a Kildare perspective at underage level too. They have been very good. Uh, me and Kildare have been challenging that Dublin hegemony to a big extent at underage level. It hasn't really translated to senior level yet, and that may come in time. There's a lot of work to be done to get those players to make that difficult step up into senior football we know that better than anybody in Cork given the amount of players we produce and none of them seem to come through so it is difficult to get it to get lads to come through but they've given themselves every chance by producing good underage sides in both counties and I think it's a brilliant final what like I mean it'll be a massive crowd like if you look at Sligo's run in the Connacht Championship they beat Roscommon, Mayo and Galway all the way from home and then not carry out in the semi-final it's an extraordinary achievement. I mean, it might sound patronising, but this is, this is a heady times for Sligo football. And you'd wish them every success in the final. I think regardless of who wins it from here, I think it's good for Gaelic football and it'll be really one to look forward to. Yeah. And look, I think, Peter, you've seen this with your own lads coming through with the under 20s over the last number of years. It is a good stepping stone in terms of a competition that brings lads through who can play senior football within the next couple of years. Absolutely. The final last year was in Carrick. Um, Shannon Throne played Kildare. Kildare brought uh, great support that day. There was great colour. They really got behind their side. And, you know, I've seen the videos and pictures after the game when they went back to Kildare, even though they had lost all Ireland final, they had great support and, and, and a great turnout for them. Um, that has motivated, it has whetted their appetite getting to the final. A lot of those lads are back now. And again, Brian Flanagan has done a terrific job. And absolutely, those lads are, are capable of step, uh, stepping up to senior level in another year or two. Didn't surprise me that that they beat down because, um, you know, they beat Dublin on their big physical side, you know, Kildare. So um, absolutely, that's um, that's a big game for them. And Sligo and Kildare, novel under 20 final mm-hmm. parents. So that, that'll be something to look forward to, absolutely. Yeah, looking forward to that. Um, let's finish off then on Kerry Clare. I know you were at this one, Peter, yesterday. I do think the Clifford story, just the way that they've been wrapped by the GAA community was really poignant yesterday. Like just watching them leaving the pitch yesterday, the amount of people there. What was it like at the Gaelic grounds? Because there's no doubt it was a somber atmosphere, but I thought the lads did incredibly well even just to be able to play that game, not to mind the way that they played. Yeah, it, it was a somber, a very strange feeling. Jackie uh, walking into the game, even that there didn't seem to be that buzz that you would expect of a monster final. And maybe because there is the, the round robin and, and, and Claire were going to be in it, um, you, you just didn't get that sense, even from Claire, that they were up for the fight. And there wasn't a glove really on, until. They were very flat. Subs. They were very flat. They were, Peter, until yeah. the two subs came on, they added a bit of spark, uh, Aguero and Keanu O'D. They got leathered into the Kerry lads. But up until that, there, there wasn't. And it, it was devoid of atmosphere. Back to your first point, Jackie, about the two Cliffords. When we heard that news on, on Saturday about the death of Allen, there, there was a bit of you know debate as, well, the two lads aren't, aren't going to play. But um, the more you thought about it and how their family and how has been an O'Shea and how she's steeped in Gaelic football, that they've obviously talked, the family had talked about this and the two boys felt and the family felt the best way that they could go out and honour their mum was to perform in a, in a monster final. So, uh, and what it's like, um, my father passed away the week before the Ulster final back in 2003. So that was a week that I had to come to terms with that. And it is difficult. There's no point in saying otherwise. Uh, and you really want to go out 
you're putting a bit of pressure on yourself to perform. So the two boys would have been going out in that frame of mind. Obviously, a lot of things would have been going through their head. But if you were to pick out Kerry's two two of Kerry's best players, there were two Kerry's best players. Three Poddy six, three six between the two of them, like. Uh, yeah. But Paddy Clifford, Rory, many times have you heard me saying about his distribution, about his heads up football, mm. his work rate off the ball. He was in his own square making uh, interceptions, and every time he got the ball around the middle of the pitch, head up right away, knew when to give it, knew when not to give it. He scored a brilliant goal to wrap it off. So that's Paddy. Never mind uh, David. So. Once again, um, just to be there to watch them boys perform is, is always a treat. But uh, to, for them to perform in the circumstances that they had to endure was, was something else. And as if they couldn't have gone up any higher in, in your estimation, they, they certainly have. Yeah. Well, Sean Kavanagh called David Clifford last night a gift to football. You know, he was saying he's going to be the greatest of all time. And look, I think Rory, you and I are on here with one of the greatest of all time. And yep. just even have a lad in this legacy being talked about this way. It's like, it's, it's just a pleasure to watch him play football. Like it genuinely is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He's like, it's hilarious. Actually, Fossa went on their All Ireland Junior Club run. Apparently, they were getting gates of five and six thousand people were going out watching junior football in Kerry because he was playing and Paddy was playing as well. I think the biggest, like, look, he's special. There's no point in saying otherwise. Mick Foley had a brilliant piece actually in the Sunday Times yesterday about how good a soccer player so many of Kerry players are, particularly Clifford himself, and the potential that he could have had if he had decided. If he was born in a different county and maybe go across channel, he was that good. He was certainly might have got an opportunity anyway. And you can see that, like, he's just effortless left and right. And obviously, he favours the left. But, I mean, it's just, just he's just glorious. I always remember there was a piece I did with him for, it was no interview. I just wanted to film him ahead of the 2018 championships. So it was the agreement that I made with the management at the time was there's, there's no interview going to be conducted here. So I just need him basically as props. And I was just going to film them and um, just kicking balls, doing little bits and bobs. It was for a piece that went out at the start of the Sunday game. And we got a couple of different players involved. I think Conor McManus, Garrod Hagerty, Shamie Harnady, um, and so on, Brian Fenton. But I wanted to make sure that he kicked the ball over the bar. And I said, are you sure you're in close enough? And he looked at me as if to say... <laughs> Are you for real? Are you from <laughs> Cork? Yeah, 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 yeah. Are you actually for real? You know, but he didn't say anything. But I knew from the look that he was basically saying, "You're some gobshite." But uh, it was he, he. He's just he really is a special talent. Oozes class on and off the field. I think they poor old Claire ran into a haymaker yesterday. They Kerry just seemed to be on it from the word go. And um, the Peter's spot on. I just felt like they didn't really get into Kerry's faces, but they weren't able to. Kerry were just moving the ball so quickly and so fluently. And there was just a zip in Kerry's play that we haven't seen, certainly didn't see during the league. First time winning a game this year outside of Kerry themselves. Maybe the challenge wasn't exactly wall that it cra was cracked up to be, but I think from their point of view, it'll be job done, move on to the round robin. Uh, the only negative... If there is one, I suppose, really, is the injury potentially to Jason Foley. That's a very key position. I think he's arguably the best fullback around. He's certainly up there with one of them. He's, ver he's very much made that position his own now after maybe a ropey enough start because he's not a natural fullback and it took him a while to adjust to it. And if that's a hamstring injury, which it did look... Now, he walked off, he looked okay, but you just never know with these things. And that would be a difficult position for them to fill given how good he's been and basically tags the best player on the opposition invariably. So I think that would be the only negative from a Kerry perspective. But uh, yeah, I just, yeah, it, it was just Claire just really couldn't get to the pitch of it, but still plenty of football for them uh, to come. And uh, they're in, in the midst of an Ulster, an, a mini Ulster championship and Claire. So it'd be interesting to see how they get on there. Yeah. Uh, what do you make of what Rory says there uh, about, I suppose, the challenges they're facing, Peter? If you're Jack O'Connor and you're sitting there, how well primed do you think they are for a back-to-back All-Ireland run? Because, you know, that Jason Foley injury aside, how do you think they're motoring? Very good. That's the best. Yeah, I'd agree with Rory and that that's the best we've we've seen them so far. I would have said in, in the National League, 
that the concern for Kerry is what happens when, when you shut David Clifford down. Now, he was superb yesterday. I felt Killian Brennan did his very best on him, but too many times he was isolated. You can't you can't allow David to go one-on-one -on -one with, with anybody. I thought his other defenders at times were very slow to get in and, and, and get a bit of extra cover. But So you're looking around yesterday, and I would say that's the best I've seen Tony Brosnan play. And yeah. it's obvious from the Kerry point of view that a couple of years ago that uh, their defence, a lot of criticism was fired their way about their defence. And since Paddy Talley has come in, you can see that the forwards have definitely upped their game in terms of their contribution to the defence. So you have Tony Brosnan chasing back. He, he was involved in a, a number of turnovers. Darren Moynihan in the first half, very good going forward and, and involved in a number of scores. Um, but his work rate... Paddy Clifford, likewise, and involved in turnovers. So that's a facet of their game that has definitely improved. But um, if they're going to take it to another level, they need to give more support for, for David. And Brosnan has the potential to do that. He was involved. He scored the first goal involved in the second brilliant crossfield pass. And, he, you know, he has the winning, the winning of games himself in terms of his finishing and whatnot. So from that point of view, uh, I think Jack will be well, well pleased. They're starting to, to come to the boil. And you look at their group, they're, they're going to have Cork, they're going to have Mayo and either Dublin or Louth. And it'd be great to see Louth beating Dublin now and putting the dubs in there as well. Yeah. So, and, we're get, and we're getting Cork and Kerry after all, Jackie, down the park as well. <laughs> see, that's it, yeah. That's right. So look, uh, yeah. but sorry. Jack will be happy. I think he's, there were so many things went well for them that they're starting to come to the boil maybe at the right time. I do think, Rory, they will actually be glad, though, that they're getting a game against Mayo, which will be incredibly valuable Definitely. for him. Because, like, I've already heard Jack O'Connor this year saying it's not their fault that they haven't been challenged. They beat Tipperary by 20 points. They beat Clare by 14 points. Last year, they had a huge winning margin in the Munster Championship as well. It's certainly not Jack O'Connor's fault to bemoan the challenge they get. But I think having Mayo in their group in particular is, is a big one because at least it gives him a, a sense check of where they are. Big time. Spot on. What was very interesting actually yesterday in the two post-match interviews that both players did, they referenced the league game between the two counties and the hiding that Kerry took up there. Mm -hmm. So I, I like Tyg Morley and Shane Ryan both mentioned it when they were speaking to Joanne afterwards and speaking to Marty. Uh, and I thought that was very pointed because this is obviously a thing and I would expect fire and brimstone from Kerry, particularly given the game is in um, Fisher Stadium <clears throat> and it'll be, look, it should be a massive crowd. We know that the Mayo, the Mayo crowd are, you know, insatiable supporters. They will be, they will travel in massive numbers. It'll be a fantastic occasion. It, you know, it should be a really, a really good contest. I don't care if there is three teams to come out. I think these are two of the top. There's three teams that, like I know certain people, I saw Jim McGuinness saying that there's seven teams. I don't, but I don't agree. I don't actually think there's seven teams can win this year's All-Ireland. Could be proven wrong yet, and we'll see how that bears out. But I think two of the three that I think can win it are going to meet in the very first game in the round robin. And that's, you know, really one to savour for everyone. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, last word then, Peter, I suppose the uh, provincial championships, we've just had two absolute woeful games at the weekend. It's all down to the Ulster Football Championship to save us at the weekend now to, to tell us provincial football isn't over just yet. What do you reckon? Mm. No. Um, don't know about that. <laughs> um, look, uh, I'm always one. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of the Ulster and, and I know there's a lot of flaw flaws to the system that we currently have, but I think we we'll have to give it Mm. a chance and I was hoping right we get real good provincial championships and that'll make people set up and, and so just going through the Ulster championship that's always close and tight and competitive games we've had seven games so far how many really good games would you say we've had one mm -hmm. throwing one, one in. One of yeah. yeah really good yeah, and yeah. Uh, one maybe good to average and the, the rest very average um, in terms of tightness of games um. With one that one game was close, and the rest I don't think I've got within five points mm. in terms of winning margins. So for me to be blowing me trumpet about Ulster, you can't really turn to this year's championship and and see it. Um, but we're going to. I think we'll. I think we'll have a good final. Mm. And again, for those there's people, there's a novelty that, to it as well, Peter, isn't there? To a degree, there's a novelty, but the the two of the up and coming 
counties. Well, Derry, you can't say they're up and coming, but they have to win it last year. But they're getting better. Armagh's getting better. And in terms of fan base, um, both teams have been really well supported this past couple of years. So if you wanted to take someone to, to see the atmosphere on a proper provincial final day, come to Clonus on, on Sunday and you'll definitely see that. In terms of football, I think it's Armagh have to bring uh, something to the table that they haven't brought yet. They've been winning games. They've been playing to a fairly high level. Now they, they really need to go to a high level if they're going to beat Derry. Derry's performance against Monaghan has been, for me, the most complete performance of the year um, from start to finish, from their full back to their full forward. A lot of players playing close to their potential and as a manager and as a management setup, that's all that you're aiming to do is looking to maximise the individual potential of every player and, and Derry came really close to that against Monon, blew them away. So if they can replicate that performance, I, I can't see Armagh beating them. I can see Armagh causing problems. They have big men in the right areas to cause problems to Derry and I think they will they will be trying out a few things to to exploit Derry. But um, as, as I say, Derry have, have too much going forward. And when I say going forward, you're, you're talking 15 players who go forward yeah. and who are capable of hurting you on, on the scoreboard. So look, it, it will be, it'll be a great atmosphere. It's an intriguing game. Uh, Rory Gallagher v. Kieran McGinney. Um, but I'll, I'll say this time, it'll be, it'll be Gallagher that'll be coming out on top. Yeah, we'll have manager cam on that one on the sideline uh, for sure. Uh, looking forward to that one and the Leinster final as well. We'll be back on Thursday to preview those. But for the moment, Peter, thanks a million for being with us and have a great week. Cheers, Jackie. Oh, there's the whistle. It's over. It's over.